next section, as you can see from the title, is Game Theory for Safety and Security. We look at the agenda, it's the applications of security games. Uh, on that, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Arnush Sinha, right? Close enough, thank you. Yeah, no, oh, sorry. No, <laughs> okay. That's fine. Okay, thank you, Victor, uh, th and thank you, Chris, for inviting me here. So I am Arunesh Sinha. Uh, I am a research faculty at University of Michigan. Uh, and I just joined Michigan, actually, uh, four months ago. Uh, before that, I was a postdoc at University of Southern California in Milin Tambe's group. Uh, so Chris already mentioned about Milin Tambe. And a lot of the applications that I'll present today actually happened uh, in my work with uh, Milin Tambe's group at University of Southern California. So uh, to get started, uh, I mean, security, we all know, is a big issue. I don't have to convince uh, any one of you here. Uh, but there could be various types of security considerations. So there could be threats like terrorism. Uh, another type of security consideration could be urban crime. Uh, and uh, finally, I mean, these days, cybersecurity is becoming a big headache for a lot of uh, uh, agencies. Now, uh, a central problem uh, in uh, most of these security scenarios is that there are limited security resources that the defender has, and the number of assets that he has to protect is huge. And so the central problem here is how should you allocate this limited security resources? Given that your adversary is adaptive, intelligent, and observant. So that's the central problem that we would be handling in all of the security applications that uh, I'll present. Uh, I do want to mention some prior security applications that are actually deployed in the real world. So this is with uh, Prof. Professor Milin Tambe's group. His group started all of this work. Chris mentioned about this 2007 mm -hmm. deployment of uh, game theoretic tools at uh, LA airport. Uh, and he also mentioned about the deployments at, on, uh, on the coast and scheduling of federal air marshals that also happens using such a game theoretic technique. So all of this work came out of Milin Tambe's group at University of Southern California. Now, uh, in the next slide, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to give, through a toy example, describe what a Stackelberg game is. Now, Chris has already done this, uh, but what I'm going to do is repeat that, because uh, it's not an easy concept. So uh, I'm going to repeat, essentially, what Chris did, but I'll do it quickly. So, uh, so the Stackelberg game, uh, as was mentioned, uh, here, the defender moves first. He lays out his defense. The adversary observes, and then he responds. So in this game here, in this toy example here, there is an adversary uh, who wants to hijack one of the two flights. One is a blue flight, one is a white flight. So that is shown uh, in this uh, column here. Uh, and there is a defender who can defend only one of the flights, either the blue flight or the white flight, because he is limited in the security resources he has. So he can defend only one flight. Now, if the defender on day one defends one of the flights, say the blue flight, and every day he keeps defending the blue flight, then this is like a predictable pattern. Uh, the defender is defending the same flight every day. Now the adversary knows what to do. He will go and hijack the white flight. And uh, this is a very simple case of a predictable pattern, but Another case could be where the defender on odd days uh, protects the blue flight and on even days protects the white flight. That is also a predictable pattern. Now, how to make this unpredictable? So a way to make this unpredictable is if the defender randomizes. So if the defender randomizes and say on day one he protects the blue flight, on day two say the white flight, and so on, and day three the blue flight, and, and he, if he chooses to protect these flights at random, then the adversary cannot predict on the next day which flight is going to be protected. And that increases the uncertainty for the adversary. And hence, probably the adversary will be deterred. He will not uh, want to hijack any of the flights. So this is formally captured as a game, as a Stackelberg game. And Chris uh, described the formal structure of a Stackelberg game earlier in his presentation. So the adversary knows the defender's randomized strategy. So it knows that the defender is going to defend the blue flight with 75% probability and the white flight with 25% probability. But on any given day, the adversary does not know which flight will be protected. Uh, and uh, then the solution concept of such a game is called a Stackelberg equilibrium, which finds this optimal randomization. 
Uh, so it finds actually this number, 0.75 and 0.25. Now I'm not going to go into how that Stackelberg equilibrium is computed, uh, but for that you can read all the papers that are there uh, on this topic. What I'm going to talk about are three applications. So first is this threat screening games. Uh, this was used to model the scenario of screening passengers at airports. Then there is this other application called audit games, which is used to screen for insider threats. And then there is another application of a crime prediction, where we actually combine game theory and machine learning. So it's a, a very novel kind of uh, application where we are using learning within games. So to get started with threat screening games, so the biggest operation, almost the biggest operation in the world of screening people is what TSA does. Okay, uh, TSA screens about 800 million passengers every year, a huge number. And recently, it started this uh, DAMS program, Dynamic Aviation Risk Management Solution, uh, the aim of which is to overhaul the whole of uh, the screening process. And a part of that project came to the CREATE Center of Excellence. So this is the DHS Center of Excellence at University of Southern California. And uh, uh, even a subpart of that project came to Professor Milintambe, and I was doing a postdoc with him. So that is how I got to work on this project. So the part of the project that came to us was on how to model the screening of passengers. And uh, there are two considerations here. Uh, one is screening effectiveness, and other is timely screening. So timely screening is important because we don't want passengers to wait like two hours before they get screened. It's the passengers get uh, frustrated. Now, screening effectiveness is also important. So one of the most effective screening methods is pat down, okay? But you can probably not do more than say 10 pat downs an hour. So, so every passenger cannot be given a pat down. That's not possible. And hence here there is a trade off. So some passengers will have to be given a pat down, but then there are a large number of passengers that will have to go through other measures. So uh, I'll show how we capture this uh, trade off in our model. Uh, so in our model, so we are modeling this as a game. Uh, if you recall from the presentations, a game should have players. Our two players are the screener, which is TSA, and the adversary, which is a terrorist. Now there are a number of other uh, people involved here. These are these benign screenies. They are actually not players in the game, but they are present there to, uh, to get screened. Uh, so the way the current screening approach works is uh, broadly there are two broad passenger categories. Uh, one is TSA pre, and then there is all, all of the other people. Uh, within each category, uh, the screening is essentially similar for all the passengers. I mean, there are some exceptions, like children don't have to take off their shoes, and so on and so forth. But broadly, within one category, the level of screening uh, given to uh, any passenger is same. So what is the problem with this? The problem is, first of all, you see long queues, especially when there is a, a like a, at peak hours in big airports or during holiday seasons, you see long queues at airports. So that's frustrating for passengers. And then there is a lot of screening time that's actually spent on benign passengers. Uh, I mean, these are passengers who are quite harmless. I mean, probably they shouldn't be screened as much, but uh, right now the, ways the, uh, the way the passenger categories are set up, they get uh, screened the same amount as, say, another passenger who could be quite harmful. So, so before, we, before I'm, uh, I show you how we model this scenario, what I'm actually going to show you is how our proposed solution will work in practice. So in our proposed solution, what we propose is that the passengers should be divided into finer categories, not just two categories. And the categories should be based on risk levels and flight. So these risk levels are some kind of a risk score that is associated with every passenger. So this also is part of the dance program. This is something we are not handling. Another uh, team in the dance program is handling how to compute the risk scores for every passenger. Uh, and then uh, based on the flight that they are taking. And uh, I'll show later on that this finer categorization of passenger results in a better, uh, uh, a lower expected loss for the defender, which is lower risk for the defender, essentially. 
And then the screening will be tailored for each category. The screening in each category will still be same for every person, but it, it will be different for different uh, categories of passengers. And another thing is that the screening of passengers within each category will be randomized. So this is coming back from my example. It's always better to randomize than to choose deterministic uh, strategies. And hence, uh, that is where the game part is coming in, where within each category of passenger, the screening will be randomized. So I'll sh I'm going to show here through an example how this will work. So first, uh, there is TSA, which is this blue, blue agent here. Uh, it has a number of screening resources. So for example, it has X-ray, it has metal detector. AIT machine is this machine where you stand like this. Uh, then there is, uh, so and the thing is these resources don't get used by themselves. Sometimes they team up. So for example, a person could be subjected, uh, his baggage could be subjected to X-ray and then he goes through AIT. So you have a team of X-ray plus AIT. Now there are resource, capacity bounds on each of these resources. For example, you cannot do more than 50 x-rays in an hour. So this is just an example. I don't know the real numbers. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then there are a list of uh, passengers who are coming in. Uh, one of the passengers is an adversary. You can see who it is here. But uh, when TSA is screening, actually it doesn't get to see that. So TSA, TSA just sees uh, passengers, OK? So when the first passenger would come in, then from his boarding pass, what would be revealed is his category. So for example, here, his category is low risk, and he's taking a domestic flight. Then this would map to a probability distribution over the different teams, which, uh, so in this case, it means that there is a 4% probability that he would go through X-ray plus metal detector. Uh, and there is a 90% probability that he would go through X. So you see there is more probability placed on the less effective resource, X-ray. X-ray by itself is less effective. Uh, and so this passenger who is low risk would most likely go through the X-ray machine only. His baggage would go through the X-ray machine only. Now the next passenger comes in. Uh, he is still low risk, but he's taking an international flight. Okay, so. So then the distribution over the, uh, uh, the screening teams, they change slightly. Now there is more weight being put on the more effective screening teams. So more effective meaning X-ray plus metal detector and X-ray plus AIT. More weight is being put on those screening teams. So most likely this passenger would probably go through X-ray plus metal detector. Okay, and then the adversary comes in. Now of course the the, the TSA agent doesn't know that he's an adversary. So this adversary would quite likely be in a high risk category and probably taking an international flight. And then this category then would map to such a distribution over the screening teams, where there is 95% probability that he goes through X-ray plus AIT. X-ray plus AIT here is the most effective screening team. So then this passenger would most likely go through X-ray plus AIT. So this example here is just showing you uh, how this system would work when it's deployed. Right now, it's being tested. So right now, it's not deployed. And oh, I do want to mention that this project is right now even classified. So I, uh, uh, so I don't know what's exactly going on. Uh, but I can talk about this because this is a part of the work that got published before the work was classified. Okay, so. Uh, so this is how the proposed solution will work. Uh, I do uh, want to now uh, describe a little more details of uh, what the model is. So if so, we are modeling this as a game, uh, and in a game you need to know what the action of the players are. So first is the defender. So defender's action here is to allocate the screening teams to passengers. That is uh, what uh, the defender's action is. But it's constrained by a couple of things. One is the resource capacity constraint. So for example, as I said, that the, you cannot do more than 40 x-rays in an hour. And another is uh, passenger flow constraints, which is saying that all the passengers that arrive uh, should be screened uh, quickly. Like we, The way we do it is we have some estimate of the number of passengers who will arrive in one hour. 
and that number of passengers should be screened in th that hour. So, uh, so these two constraints define what the defender's allocation can look like. The adversary's action is to choose a passenger category to arrive. Uh, so uh, that's uh, what the adversary can choose. The payoffs of the player, so the defender's payoff here uh, measures the expected loss from a successful attack, which in some sense is a measure of the risk. Okay, lower it is, uh, lower loss or lower risk is better. Uh, and uh, the probability that there will be a successful attack is a function of both the defender's and uh, adversary's strategy. Okay, so that is where the game component is coming in. It's not just uh, based on what I do, it, but my reward is also based on what the other uh, adversary is doing. Similarly, for the adversary's payoff, it's the opposite of the defender. So it measures the expected gain from a successful attack. And again, the probability that the attack will be successful depends on both the defender and the adversary strategy. So this is the payoff of the player. So uh, after these payoffs and the model has been built, uh, the equilibrium computation involves solving an optimization problem. Uh, I'm just stating here this in simple text. Uh, I didn't want to put any math, so that is why I've not put any equations here. Uh, the defender's objective is to maximize its own payoff, which is to minimize loss. So that is pretty simple. Now that payoff is expressed as a function of the defender's randomized strategy and the adversary strategy. And this also should be subject to another constraint that the adversary is intelligent. So he's observing, and then the adversary plays his own best response. Okay? So this is subject to the condition that the adversary strategy is a best response. Uh, I'm not going to describe the optimization problem anymore, but what I want to show you is this optimization problem has a scalability challenge. This is a very large game. Uh, so for example, for the defender, there are 10 to the 41 actions. Uh, um, Chris showed you some toys examples. I also showed you toy examples with just two actions. Okay, but in real applications, these number of actions can explode. So in this case, it's 10 to the 41. For some larger airports, it could actually be even uh, much more than that. Uh, the equilibrium computation here is hard, so I call it NP hard. This is a computer science term, but it essentially means that it's not easy to compute the equilibrium. Uh, and what we also observed is that uh, there are large-scale optimization techniques, uh, like uh, column generation, uh, for example, is one. These actually fail to scale for this problem. Uh, and uh, there are also some other techniques, like compact representation, but they have other problems that they can throw up invalid solutions. So what we proposed in this paper uh, is this algorithm called marginal guided algorithm, which actually was able to scale up to our size of the problem and produce effective solutions. Uh, I'll give you evidence of that right here. Uh, so in here, I'm actually com comparing our algorithm, MGA, with the prior algorithm, column generation, CG. And as you can see, this is runtime. So the x-axis is the number of flights. More the number of flights, the larger is the problem size. And the y-axis is the runtime. It's actually in the log scale. So as you can see, column generation takes much more time it's, uh, than, uh, than our approach uh, in computing the solution. But the other fact is that the solution that the column generation approach produces is actually worse quality. So this is being shown in this graph uh, towards the right, where uh, again, the x-axis is the number of flights, uh, and the y-axis is showing the screener's utility. This is the defender's payoff. As you can see, with the MGA approach, you obtain actually better payoff than you do with the column generation approach. So the column generation approach is slower, and it e is not even able to produce the optimal solution. So in that sense, uh, this uh, uh, scalability is a large challenge in all such game theoretic applications. and uh, you will see that there are a number of novel things that are required to scale up to real problem sizes that we encounter in the real world. So one thing that I had promised earlier to show was that uh, uh, if there are more passenger categories, it is actually helpful for the defender. So this graph is actually showing that. There are three versions. So TSG stands for Threat Screening Game. 
So there are three versions of the threat screening game. One uh, TSD U, U for unitary, means one, one in which there is only one category of passengers. TSD R means where the categories are only decided by the risk score. And TSD RF means where the categories are decided by the risk score and the flight that the passenger is taking. So TSD RF has the most finest, finest grained category. And you can see that the utility that the defender obtains uh, is higher as the number of categories of the passenger is increased. So this uh, game theoretic mathematical model actually allows us uh, to precisely explain why having more finer categories uh, results in better risk management for the defender. So this uh, it completes my description of threat screening game. But uh, uh, before moving on, I want to mention that this threat screening game is actually a very general model for screening. So here we have applied it to screening of airport passengers. But there is another scenario, uh, a cybersecurity scenario. So this is like a network administrator. They are usually uh, f uh, like uh, uh, flooded with alerts. Okay, They don't know what to do with most of the alerts. Uh, in fact, there was a recent case of an attack on target where there were so many alerts generated, but the network administrator did not notice that, because there are uh, so many alerts generated. So this, is, again, as you can see, is a problem of screening. There are a number of alerts. You can correspond the alerts to the passengers. And then from s some of the alerts among them are malicious, so bad. So that is what you have to detect. So right now, we are working on uh, using this threat screening game kind of model for screening for alerts that arise in a security operation center. Actually, Chris is also collaborating with us on this one. Uh, so, so this completes my description of threat screening games. Uh, next, I want to talk about the, some work that I did in my PhD. Uh, so this work is not being used uh, anywhere right now. Uh, this is a more theoretical work in nature. Uh, but this has potential uses. So that's why I'm going to mention this. Uh, so I call this audit games. Uh, and the motivation of this work was uh, privacy concern in healthcare. Uh, so what is the concern? So HIPAA is a privacy law. Men, some of you may know it. Some of you may have signed some forms about HIPAA when you go to the hospital uh, without reading actually what there is. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but it's meant to govern uh, the aspects of privacy uh, with respect to electronic health records. Uh, and uh, actually, there have been a lot of cases where hospitals have been fined for privacy violations. So I'm showing you one uh, news clip here. But then there are other news clips also. For Different hospitals have got different amounts of fine for privacy violation. So, so what's going on here? Uh, so to understand this, so I don't know if you guys watch any cartoon or not, but this is this is Dexter, <laughs> and uh, and he visits uh, his friend Mandark in the hospital to understand what's going on, and what happens in hospitals is that the access control regime. So there is a database of electronic health records which contains the health records of all the patients, but almost everyone is allowed to access this database. All nurses, all doctors, and that's for a reason because if you deny access to an electronic health record in the case of an emergency, that can have very bad consequences. The patient can die. Okay? So, so there is a reason for having this permissive real-time access control in hospitals. In fact, even in non-hospital settings, the access control is often quite permissive. Because if you make it very rigid, that stops the flow of information. That can cause uh, suboptimal decisions and suboptimal productivity in organizations. And so here, the employees then are trusted to do the right thing. But uh, if there is a malicious employee, a malicious insider, then they can get access to some uh, sensitive health record and, uh, and then cause a privacy breach. So this is what has happened in all of the scenarios that I listed uh, before. Um, now, one way to handle this is to do auditing. Because you cannot do this real-time access control thing. So, what you can do is a post hoc inspection, after the fact inspection of the employee's accesses of health records. And then you can detect violations among them and then punish the violators if they are caught. Um, so auditing happens in a lot of organizations, not just in hospitals, and is actually an effective way to deal with insider threats. 
uh, it happens in financial companies it happens with computer security auditing so so the model that i'm going to describe while it's set in the hospital setting but it could potentially also be uh, used in other auditing settings so so here is the model uh, it's again has the same flavor there are two auditors and then there are n suspicious cases that need to be investigated the two auditors can inspect some k k cases where k is much much less than n so there is a problem of limited security resources and then there is an adversary the adversary uh, could commit a violation if he commits a violation and it's not caught by the auditor then he gains some benefit out of it if he commits a violation and that gets caught by the auditor then there is a then he gets punished okay so this punishment is very different in our organization setting remember how for how moist please report to circulation how okay. moist please report to circulation okay <laughs> that's not me okay so <laughs> uh so if with the employee in an organization punishments can shape their behavior remember that for terrorists i never talked about punishment because uh, for terrorists punishment may not really deter them uh, i mean they are willing to die so uh, but for employees in an organization punishment is very important and punishment can shape their behavior and that is one way in which this model uh, really differs from the other uh, security games model that uh, Chris has talked about and the previous model that I described. So let's uh, look into this further. Uh, so here the action of the player, uh, the defender uh, chooses a randomized allocation of the limited inspections that he can do, but he also chooses a punishment level. Okay, so here the, we are rolling in the choice of punishment level uh, within the model itself. It's not a fixed static punishment decided a priori. The adversary plays a best response, which is he chooses a misdeed to commit, um, and the adversary will get punished if the, that misdeed is caught. Now, the payoff of the player. So the defender payoff includes the loss uh, that is incurred from a successful breach. And again, the probability of breach is a function of both the defender and the adversary strategy. But there is another component here. It also includes a loss from a high punishment level, in the sense that punishment Imposing punishment is not free for the defender. Uh, because if it were free, you would impose infinite punishment, and that would deter any employee from doing it. But a high punishment level has a cost for the organization. And this cost could be, it could create a negative work environment, and that creates a loss for the uh, organization. People may not be willing to share data because of such a high, and not sharing data can cause loss for the uh, organization. Uh, but it could also result in some immediate loss. Like if you fire an employee, for example, then you have to rehire someone. So those are some kind of immediate losses that uh, could be caused due to high punishment. And the adversary payoff, again, it includes the gain from a successful breach. Again, the probability of attack is uh, a function of both their strategies. The adversary's payoff also includes the loss due to punishment when uh, the adversary is caught. So then the optimization problem here, again, has a very similar nature to the previous problem. It is, again, to maximize the defender's uh, payoff, which is to minimize his loss. And uh, this is a function of the defender's inspection, his punishment level, and the adversary strategy. And then this is subject to the constraint that the adversary strategy is a best response. Now, the, the, the technical difference from the previous application is that this constraint here uh, makes this problem nonlinear. And, uh, for those who are familiar a little bit with optimization, any time you go into nonlinearity, it makes the problem much harder. So, so then we use some um, uh, optimization methods actually to uh, get to some fast computation for this problem. So, so that completes my description of uh, the model of audit games. Uh, uh, for I'm not going to show you runtime results and all here. I, I'm just show, going to show you that this model is actually can capture things that are happening uh, in the real world. So one thing that this model predicts is that uh, doctors will be punished less than nurses for the same violation. And what is the reason for that? The reason for that is a punishing a doctor has a higher cost for the hospital than punishing a nurse. Because if you suspend a doctor for a day, that's a higher cost for the hospital than suspending a nurse for a day. 
Now, this may seem unfair also, but, uh, but this is actually happening in practice. I mean, there are news reports out there which show that for the same offense, for stealing drugs, nurses get punished more than doctors. Uh, so in some sense, this model is able to capture this real-world economics uh, of uh, punishments that is uh, happening out there uh, in hospitals. So, uh, so in the end, I want to say that uh, this is a general model for auditing. We have used it in the hospital context, but it could also be used in other contexts. And, uh, and punishment costs lead to like a trade-off between deterrence and the loss uh, due to misdeed. And then uh, these, all this competition can be done efficiently. So uh, that actually completes my uh, part on the auditing thing. Uh, my last application that I want to talk about is crime prediction uh, using learning in games. So how much time do I have? Okay, I have some time. Uh, so, so in this uh, problem, um, so urban crime. Um, now urban crime, the crimes are small. It's not of as big a magnitude that, as terrorist strikes. But these small things add up very quickly. So for example, in 2009, there were a lot of crimes which resulted in a loss of about $11 billion uh, for the economy. So this is actually one of the answers to your uh, questions that you have. OK. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so what is the challenge here with urban crime? Uh, it, again, is a defender-adversary interaction. As you can see, there is a police and criminal in interaction happening here. But, but it's a very different nature. Uh, the na why is this different? Because it's very difficult to say what's a criminal's payoff. Uh, in some sense, because a criminal may be doing, committing crime because he's poor, or he could be committing crime because he's greedy. Now, it's very difficult to quantify what a criminal's payoff is. And the thing is, criminals are also not uh, all of the same type. Uh, so they are heterogeneous. Uh, different types of criminals have different motivations. Another thing is criminals are also not very strategic. Uh, so this has been noted in criminology literature that uh, they exhibit this behavior called opportunistic behavior. So wherever there is an opportunity for crime, they'll commit a crime. They're not strategically planning that we have to commit crime here. So these are some challenges to be addressed in this urban crime setting, uh, which is different from the other terrorist setting. Um, but there's an opportunity here. There is, there is data available about past police and criminal uh, interaction. So how many crimes were committed, and how many people were caught, and stuff like that. So these da this data could be useful. So what we do is we pre present this solution, uh, is this predictive policing solution. And this is presented in two papers in this conference called AMAS. Uh, what we, the domain that we are using here is the University of Southern California campus. So the, so the University of Southern California, USC campus, has a USC police, OK? And that USC police patrols the campus and areas around it. From them, we got this data about uh, their patrols, so how they are patrolling the area, and also about uh, the crimes uh, that were reported uh, in the USC area. So from this, what we did was we learned the criminal behavior but very importantly, we didn't learn just criminal behavior in the sense of predicting where the crime will happen. We learned a criminal behavior that was in response to patrolling. So this still is preserving the game nature of it. So the criminal is behaving, is behavior depends on what the defender does. Okay, so here we are learning the behavior of the criminal in response to patrolling. I'll ex try to explain a little more detail here in the later slides. Uh, now, once you have learned such a criminal behavior in response to patrolling, now you could design the optimal patrols that would minimize the number of crimes. Okay, so so this is what our contribution is. Uh, one thing I want to point point out here is the difference from criminology. So, in criminology, there is a philosophy of uh, crime predicts crime, where people say that uh, past crimes are an indicator of uh, how crimes will happen. We differ. With this, uh, uh, we differ here in the sense that we don't just say that crime predicts crime, but we say that crime and patrol in the past, both of them predict crime. So, so that is one way in which we differ here. And actually, on this uh, data set with the USC police, we show that this difference matters. Uh, 
Be before showing that graph, actually, I'll tell that this, uh, this piece of work uh, has actually been licensed to a startup, Armorway. So this is a startup uh, by uh, Professor Milin Tambe himself. He's one of the founders and some PhD students of his in the past. Uh, and this is actually uh, either being used or will be used very shortly at uh, University of Southern California. Now, the graph that I wanted to show here is I wanted to compare our approach. So our approach is called this EMC2 uh, uh, with some other approaches. The other approaches are like crime predicts crime, which is this uh, approach from uh, criminology. And then there is a randomized uh, um, inspection, like randomly uh, roam around and see, uh, allocate uh, police officers randomly to the areas. So now, uh, as you can see, the accuracy of predicting where the next crime will happen uh, is best in our case. It's EMC2 provides you the best accuracy out of all of these approaches. So that's why I can claim that uh, our approach, where we also consider previous uh, patrols in addition to the previous crimes actually beats this uh, philosophy of crime predicts crime. Um, I do want to again emphasize what we are doing here. What we do here is we have data about the past defender and adversary interaction. From that data, we learn the adversary behavior. Now, it's very important to note what the adversary behavior is. The adversary behavior is how the adversary would act in response to defense. Okay, uh, And then we plan the optimal defender strategy. Uh, uh, and that finally outputs a, uh, the defender strategy that should be used. Uh, I'll describe a little more details of these, uh, this, uh, this application. So the USC ca uh, campus and areas around it are actually divided into five patrol areas. Uh, there are eight hour shifts. Uh, and police officers are allocated to each patrol area. Uh, sometimes a patrol area has one police officer, sometimes it has two. It never happens that a patrol area has no police officer. Uh, the crime data we have is of the kind of number of crimes per shift per area. And the patrol data we have is number of officers per shift per area. Now, we use all of this data uh, into a learning uh, model. Now. This is like the most technical slide in my presentation, but I'm not going to describe this model, OK? So what I'm just going to say is there is a learning model, which is called a dynamic Bayesian network. Uh, the properties of this dynamic Bayesian network is that it can capture these temporal aspects. So as you can see in this model, there is this time t and t plus 1. And since we have multiple shifts, we need such a temporal aspect. And the other thing is this dynamic Bayesian network, the nodes uh, in that network represent uh, the number of police officers and the number of crimes. Uh, so I, my intention was not to uh, describe this model, and I'll not do that, but I'll say that there exists uh, such models which can capture uh, the interaction here. Uh, and once you have learned this model, what you can do is you can plan. Uh, so this dynamic Bayesian network, the model itself represents the criminal model. It represents how the criminal would react uh, to the patrolling. And then uh, you could pose the question of what should be the optimal defender strategy, which is optimal patrolling, that minimizes the number of crimes. Okay, And uh, this problem is a hard problem. Uh, but we propose uh, uh, you use a technique called dynamic programming uh, to get around the hardness of the problem. Some experimental results. Uh, so. So here, we are showing pro projected results. Uh, so on the left-hand side is the crime heat map uh, without any patrol. So as you can see, there is a lot of crime. Uh, so of course, a heat map uh, means uh, the red parts are where there is uh, more crime, and the more greener parts are less crime. So as you can see, there is quite a lot of crime uh, in the center of this picture here. So this is the main campus area. If you use random patrols, what happens is it just shifts the crime. Okay, It's not reducing the overall number of crime. Now the red areas have shifted a little bit, but crime has shifted from one area to other area. Okay, And what we show is that with the optimal patrols we design, the overall number of crimes drop. As you can see, there are no dark red areas on the, uh, on the heat map on the, yes? 
So with that criminology theory of crime predicts crime, yes. if you didn't have your far right one, which obviously you're saying is the best, but yeah. wouldn't you put your patrols in that center area? Not randomly, but rather in the area? Yes. Yes, so crime predicts crime is only about prediction of crime. It does not tell you how to optimally allocate crime. Typically, uh, what people do is uh, you get this heat map, and then people put the defenders in the most, uh, like the dark red areas here. That is what people would do. But what we claim is, uh, from a game perspective, that's not optimal. The reason for that is what would happen is that now the crime will shift from this to the other areas that are not patrolled. So in that sense, there has to be some kind of intelligent allocation. And that we are claiming is happening here, uh, because we are taking this interaction of the defender and adversary into account. Um, OK, so this is the uh, experimental results. Uh, I again want to emphasize the main point of this application, which is that uh, data can enable more effective defense. So uh, this is, again, the same pipeline that I had shown earlier. Uh, one important thing to note here, uh, I'll mention this, is that in all previous work, we used adversary's utility, adversary's payoff, then assumed the rationality on the part of the adversary, and then uh, uh, predicted how the adversary would act, and then designed optimal patrol. So that is what happens in a typical game setting. In here, we are bypassing these assumptions that we know the adversary's utility. We are even bypassing the assumption that the adversary is rational. Okay? How the adversary would behave, that prediction is completely coming from the data. Okay? So in that sense, this is more effective than just using utility and rationality-based uh, uh, predictions in normal games. Yes? Um, one thing that you know, I like the way that you're approaching this. I, mm -hmm. I think it's much more effective than the way that things have been done in the past. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you're missing here yes. is that you're looking at past data, yes. not an adversary, to yes. try to predict what they will do in the future. Yeah. So There's no <laughs> element in here where you're injecting intelligence to, to optimize your model to potential future threats. There's no predictive portion of this. It's all based off what's happened in the past. And, so, yeah. and so therefore, you're always going to be reactive. You are going to react based on what happens in the past. There will be some continual updation. Like it's it's not that once this is done, it's done. Like you'll receive the data for the next month, then you will add back that data, then refresh your model, and then yes. But we are, could you account for some intelligence information? For example, that you have that uh, an adversary is going to attack here. That's not present in this model. I agree. Uh, that could be one thing that could be added to the model. It's a uh, Actually, not that difficult to add it to the dynamic Bayesian network, the mm -hmm. thing that I showed. Uh, so, but uh, the danger becomes like back when suicide bombings were you know, first started in the Middle mm -hmm. East, it was always uh, a male of Middle Eastern descent. Uh, okay. Then, then they shifted to female. Yeah. So, yeah. what does that do in your model? Is it levels the playing field again? Because now we can't just focus on males. Now we got to yeah. focus on both sexes. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, uh, I agree that this is looking at things in the past. If uh, there are female suicide bombers come up, it will take some time to uh, refresh itself because it refreshes itself periodically. And uh, but if there is some intelligence information available that uh, you could have uh, female uh, suicide bombers, that could be taken into account in the dynamic Bayesian network. We have not done this yet, but uh, 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 that could be taken into account in the in the way we are modeling this. Yeah. So like I said, I agree with everything. I would just, I would, I would recommend putting a step in there for the ingestion of intelligence information okay. to become yeah. Yeah. predictive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. That would be helpful. I agree. Yeah. Okay, so that actually completes uh, the description of all the three applications that I wanted to talk of, about. There are two main takeaways that I want you to uh, take at the end. One is that game theory enables this intelligent randomized allocation of limited resources against an adaptive adversary. And, and in particular, if you have data available, then learning, machine learning complements this game approach, uh, making it more effective. So that ends my presentation. Thanks, okay. sir. Thank you. Thank you.